although sorry that was me <laughs> no problem i've got an alarm clock that's going to beep uh at the eight minute just to me because i will be muted uh so uh Anyway, I'm going to kick off now. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Professor Laura Vaughan. I'm a co-investigator in the network, and I'm based at the Space Syntax Laboratory at the Bartlett School of Architecture, UCL. And if you haven't worked it out so far, I am going to be chairing today's session. Um, please welcome Millie Tamworth, who is going to be live tweeting this session. And I'd like to invite everyone to introduce themselves in the chat in order to help the flow of time as we haven't got that much time uh, to spare. So uh, introduce yourselves in the chat and also please post any questions that you may have. The speakers will respond there if they can and if not I'm sure we can pick up the conversation as the day ensues. Um, if we do manage to keep to time there should be a nice amount of time to ask questions verbally at the end or if you prefer just type them in and say Laura please read them out and I'll do that. Uh, speakers, please get ready to share your slides while I introduce you and apologies in advance for the verbal two minute warning that I'll be giving you. I will try and be as discreet as possible uh, and then don't feel a need to rush because that's still 20% uh, of your time left. So do use it. Um, so now to our first speaker, Derbler from uh, King's College London, who will be speaking about the impact of remote working on feelings of loneliness and work isolation. Over to you, Derbler. Yes, thank you, um, Laura. I'm just going to start set up the presentation now, so hopefully you can all see my screen. And so my name is Derbla, and the research that I'm presenting today is part of my current master's dissertation um, in organisational psychiatry and psychology in King's College London um, with my supervisor, Dr. Mariano Pinto de Costa. And this has also been adopted by the NIHR Applied Research Collaborative of South London. And the research today is a quantitative study on the impact of workplace isolation and loneliness on well-being and the protective influence of perceived social support for NHS healthcare workers. So some background information, first of all, is that, as we know, the first confirmed case of COVID-19 was on the 31st of January 2020. And as the pandemic began to escalate by the 23rd of March 2020, a nationwide quarantine was announced for the UK. And this changed the nature of the workplace for a number of occupations. And people were required to begin working remotely immediately, giving many organisations not enough time to fully put in place proper procedures for this. So included in these working from home changes were a number of NHS healthcare trusts. Healthcare staff were forced to switch to telephone and video outpatient appointments during COVID-19 to protect the physical health of both themselves and the patients. So during this time, uh, a lot of these uh, changes were put in place for the long term and more healthcare workers in the NHS may have been subjected to feelings of loneliness and workplace isolation. Loneliness and workplace isolation are related to a number of negative wellbeing outcomes and in healthcare staff particularly, this can lead to poor patient safety outcomes and potential medical errors. Um, so although research has previously indicated that there may be a protective effect of higher perceived social support on the association between loneliness, workplace isolation and poor wellbeing outcomes, um, we're looking to see if uh, this is a case within um, a particular NHS healthcare trust as well. And um, therefore, even if a person is experiencing high feelings of loneliness or workplace isolation, if they also are experiencing high levels of perceived social support, we are predicting that they may not be experiencing the um, negative well-being outcomes in that case as well. And we looked at the trust um, of South London and Maudsley NHS Trust. And for anyone who may not be um, familiar with that trust, it is the widest range of mental health services prov provision in the UK. So that was um, including a lot of psychiatrists, psychologists and mental health nurses and healthcare workers. So the aims that we had of our study were to investigate the impact of remote working on feelings of loneliness and workplace isolation of healthcare employees within SLAM and additionally how these feelings may impact their well-being during the COVID-19 pandemic. We then also aim to investigate the potential protective influence of perceived social support on the association between loneliness and workplace isolation and the negative well-being outcomes that we measured. 
So therefore, for the methods, we used a cross-sectional observational study to collect data on the variables. The data was collected from the healthcare workers within SLAM via a number of methods, such as recruitment posters in their services, social media outlets, uh, particularly Twitter and LinkedIn, as well as KCL recruitment newsletters. Um, so additionally, uh, the eligibility criteria included any SLAM staff member that was over the age of 18 and currently working within SLAM. And the exclusion criteria included anyone whose role was not defined as a healthcare worker. And prior to any data collection, ethical approval was obtained from King's College London Ethical Committee. So the questionnaire that we used was consisted of five scales. So this included the UCLA loneliness scale, the workplace isolation measure, the perceived social support score, the WHO 5 wellbeing index and the GHQ 12. Um, many of these skills have also already been used within healthcare trusts in the UK as well. And prior to completing the questionnaire, data was also collected on the participants' demographics and as well as their working home from home characteristics, such as the number of hours they work from home, um, information on their productivity levels, their stress levels, and their satisfaction while working from home, and whether or not they were previously um, afforded the opportunity to work from home or only in the office and um, how many of them actually worked from home during the pandemic then. So for the data analysis, um, initially the bivariate associations between the variables were investigated using Pearson's correlations um, to look at any associations that may have been found. And then a multiple regression was also used to investigate whether loneliness, workplace isolation and perceived social support were significant in predicting the levels of well-being in the staff. And finally, a moderation analysis will also be used to determine whether or not levels of perceived social support will have an effect on the associations between loneliness and workplace isolation and the outcomes measures of well-being. So the uh, data that we have collected so far is the preliminary data as the survey is actually still open for participants um, at the moment. But in terms of what we have collected so far and the findings, uh, the sample size of 240, uh, we had surprising results of 18.3% identifying as males and 81.7% identifying as females. Uh, we had a large age range of between 21 years and 68 years. And as you can see on the screen as well, we had quite a bit of ethnic diversity with the highest percentage um, of 166 participants identifying as white or Caucasian. So in terms of the remote working characteristics of the staff within South London and Maudsley, um, within our sample, only 3.9% of participants worked remotely before COVID. So this was like very, very low. Um, and this may be because of the type of work that they did or just that the NHS was not one of the organizations that you know really um, afforded their staff with the opportunity to work remotely um, as they would be having a lot of patient contact. However, since COVID-19, 98.3% of our sample have had to work remotely at some point um, throughout the time, uh, with ma majority of them stating that they worked over 31 um, hours, between 31 um, and 40 hours uh, remotely, uh, which was quite a lot of time. Obviously, 45.2% reported that. And um, although many reported higher productivity, uh, during their time working remotely, 33.3% also reported that they had higher stress when working remotely as well. So when looking at the associations between the variables, um, the preliminary findings did um, show that there was very high average scores of both loneliness and workplace isolation um, within the staff of South London and Maudsley. And uh, Pearson's correlations also revealed that these scores were significantly correlated with scores on both the well-being outcome measures of the GHQ12 and the WHO5 well-being index. And um, with great and this indicated that greater loneliness and workplace isolation was leading to decreases in the well-being of the staff. And perceived social support was also correlated with the well-being outcome measures, uh, with higher scores of perceived social support also being associated with better well-being as we had predicted initially. Um, also, when taken into consideration the working from home characteristics. Uh, our analysis also revealed that those who reported higher stress since working from home and lower levels of satisfaction also um, had worse scores on both of the well-being outcome measures. 
And finally, when looking at a multiple regression analysis for each of the outcomes, the individual predictors were significant in predicting scores of well-being. So just, just some under, yeah, sorry, just under two minutes now. Thanks. And just um, some conclusions and future research. Uh, since COVID-19, a large number of SLAM staff have therefore been required to work from home. Many reported that their productivity was higher when at home, um, but that their stress was also higher. And these research findings indicate that SLAM staff may require extra support when working from home during the pandemic and due to the high um, experiences of loneliness and workplace isolation scores. It is also important that um, the organisation aims to prevent the harmful effects of both workplace isolation and loneliness, which may suggest a need for successful recovery planning within SLAM to minimise mental illness after the pandemic. This might suggest a reframing of the current workplace restrictions to protect the well-being of staff and a reduction in the number of hours spent working from home. So thank you so much for listening. And if anyone is interested, I can also um, link the page within the NIHR um, of the study, which will include the survey link. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was spot on. <laughs> I managed to mute myself. Um, brilliant. Okay, let's move swiftly on. I, I already have a question which I'll pop in into the chat. Uh, that was really interesting. Um, I have colleagues who work within workplace design, so I can see that being of great interest. Um, and uh, over to our second speaker, who is Dr. Stephen De Domenico from Westchester University. Okay, sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. Thanks so much for having me. Um, I'm going to talk today about um, just feeling lonely and how um, callers to a mental health line or a crisis helpline basically display and negotiate their psychoemotional states in conversation. So one of the things I'll do is give you just a really quick sense of the background and literature. I think we, we all are pretty well versed in some of these issues, so I'll go over that more quickly a little bit on data and method, um, a little bit of analysis and some closing thoughts. So to begin, I think we all here understand how important it is to think about mental illness in the world right now. So uh, the World Health Organization um, said in 2019 that one in every eight people around the world are living with a mental disorder. And just one year later, they noted um, as much as a 26% increase um, between um, Depressive, depressive symptoms and anxiety symptoms. Um, uh, of course, that's that's a huge jump. Um, and what we also want to think about is, with this broader backdrop in mind, that we also have terms to kind of parse that um, in a more uh, uh, careful way. And so we have this term known as help seeking, which um, some scholars have defined as translating the very personal domain of psychological distress to the interpersonal domain of seeking help. So the reason I wanna direct your attention here is that um, I am a communication scholar. And so I really care about what are some of the pathways to negotiating help and also to designing particular requests for help. And obviously this whole conference is focused um, very much so on loneliness and how loneliness can be a major contributor to developing mental health problems or exacerbating ones that already exist. And so we wanna keep in mind that loneliness has been documented to be a increasing problem um, not just for adults, but perhaps especially with adults, going back to some, some key research that came out, um, uh, this one particular study about the US. So that is sort of the backdrop of what we're doing. Um, obviously, my focus is on communications. And some of the questions that I really care about are what forms of help do these individuals pursue for their mental health issues and from whom? And also, what specific discursive practices are used to negotiate the request on uh, provision of mental health support? So how do they actually work through and use certain kinds of communication to, um, to go through that, that interpersonal process. So my particular focus and expertise comes in the area of, of support-centered helplines. Um, I'll lump them together for now and sort of say crisis and mental health helplines. There is nuance here that um, I won't be able to go into. Oops, um, and sorry about that. So one of the things that people call these lines for is when they're in moments of crisis and acute distress. 
and um, also more kind of we, we might call as perfunctory um, moments of, of distress. Uh, you might say when they're just looking for social and emotional support, maybe they don't perceive themselves as being in crisis or in great distress, but they simply need to hear someone or hear someone else's voice. Um, so simply just needing to talk to someone. Um, sometimes folks will talk about needing an anchor in their lives. And so these helplines serve as that purpose. Maybe they call once a week, maybe they call uh, once a day. And then others may talk about it being a supplement to um, outpatient services. Um, and so more of those routine appointments that they have and they need something to keep them in, in, in that structure of some kind. So what do we know about the, uh, the way that these are advertised is that they tend to emphasize words like listening and talking um, and hope and problems, right? So we hear, or we see just in these examples, these are just a scattered number of them. You see there's um, uh, quite a few options for people to pick from, depending, depending on the, uh, the region. Of course, we know the Samaritans very well in the UK because of the history. Now, some brief literature on helplines and specifically with conversation. Um, we all know that emotions and mental states, you know, we can largely think of emotions as being these physiological processes, but we also want to think about the way that they are interactually managed. And so the ways that the, we express and display emotions is very much socially shaped. And so we want to be mindful of that kind of performance dimension. Um, specifically, troubles tellings have been a well-documented practice through which people convey their troubles and, and sort of seek the uh, response and uptake from the recipient. We know that in particular with helplines, um, call takers can be trained to use techniques to actually help manage the emotional state of callers. And in particular, there's some research on 911 helplines, which are a very specific kind, but still um, very informative for us. And lastly, there's also a body of literature on the ways that call takers display empathy for people who call these helplines, uh, specifically to respond or the callers perform displays such as crying and other kinds of emotional states. So with all that in mind, let me tell you about the, the data that I have. Um, I worked with Help Now, which is a pseudonym. It's a mid-sized crisis center in the Northeastern US. It was founded in the 1970s. It's part of a much larger network of crisis lines. And so the data that I have is 120 audio recordings of calls made to this helpline, roughly 16 hours worth. Um, these were previously recorded for internal purposes and uh, they were anonymized, de-identified prior to analysis. And so this whole kind of approach to research um, received ethics board approval. Um, so I'm happy to ask, answer more questions about that later. For now, let me tell you a bit more about the method that I used. Um, I'm trained in a very particular method called conversation analysis. Um, that, that's quite um, a popular method at, at Loughborough University. Um, and so it's a naturalistic inductive method. So it's all based on looking at the data and kind of letting those, those bigger claims and potentially theoretical ideas emerge from the data. And so what we do is we transcribe data in great detail using conventions. You'll see examples of those in the transcript on the right. And so once we develop those really fine grained and detailed um, transcriptions, we identify a candidate phenomenon and then build collections. From that collection, we then focus on the practices and actions of the people involved. So one of the things that conversation analysts focus on sometimes is this notion of where the phenomenon happens, otherwise known as the sequential position. So I wanna just focus on briefly, where do the caller's problem presentation turns happen in a typical call in my collection? So um, I wanna start off with this call, extract one. Um, the call taker says, this is help now. The caller says, hello, my name is Sam. Hi, Sam, this is Tina. These are all pseudonyms, of course. The caller, hi, Tina. I'm anxious today, Tina, really bad. So this call begins with a greeting and what we call an institutional identification. The caller and the call taker then both kind of exchange personal names or kind of reciprocal personal name exchange. And then we get the deployment of the problem presentations. This is a fairly typical way in which it's positioned after, or one could argue at the tail end of the conversational opening. So with that sense of where this stuff happens, and I wanna focus on how it happens. So how do people actually go about um, uh, enacting these problem presentations. So there's one practice I want to focus on for the most part, which is the trouble-centered, what I call the headline format. So going back to that same extract that we just went through, I want to focus on that turn where the um, where the headline, or excuse me, the problem presentation was. You'll notice that this is a very brief format. It's produced uh, using particular symbols I won't discuss right now, but it's produced in a sort of straightforward way um, uh, uh, and, and what we call one turn constructional unit. So it's very brief and it sort of encapsulates, uh, one could argue, the, the reason that the caller is, is, is calling this particular service. 
But there's alternative formats as well. So I want to turn to one of those in the second case. The call taker says, good morning, Samantha. This is after some of the, the opening that I'm, that I'm cutting out here. So this is not the beginning. Call taker says, how are you today? Caller says, lonely. And, uh, and then there's a little bit of overlap. I don't want to go out there. I heard there were going to be thunderstorms and lightning. And then it goes on for quite a bit longer. So I want to just highlight the fact that the call taker deploys what we call a general state inquiry. This is one of the ways in which sometimes callers can be occasioned into a longer problem presentation format. So we get what's called Two um, minutes, what I call an, please. Thank you, an extended telling. So this extended telling is going to go much longer than one turn constructional unit. And of course, we see here that someone is articulating that loneliness in their current emotional state. So we get a longer justification and storytelling that goes on from there. Here's a snapshot of other formulations that come from my larger um, call set, since we would be very brief today. Um, here's one snapshot of a turn. I'm just having a tough time. Lonely, cold. I'm in a very, very bad place today. Another case. Yeah, I guess, you know, I go to therapy. I have a psychiatrist and everything. Basically, I'm just lonely. I just feel really alone, you know? And last one, I just don't like to be alone. So you see that the ways that callers actually present their loneliness or isolation, um, these are cases where it's made explicit with word choice, but it's not always the case, of course. So it's much more likely that callers are getting at this in a more implicit fashion. Um, so I won't have time to go into this today, but I did wanna say that um, a lot of my focus is based on how do the call takers take up and sort of demonstrate their understanding of the callers reason for calling. And so one of the practices that I've documented in my research is partial repetition. Many of us know for if we're clinicians anyway, or, or volunteer um, uh, uh, peer, peer responders, that using repetition is one way of demonstrating active listening and getting people to talk further. So what are some conclusions? We can say that helplines are uh, can be more traditionally seen as impersonal. They're often anonymous, um, but it's one of the ways that these individuals seek help and, um, and then they communicate their loneliness and isolation. We can also see that the ways that individuals display loneliness and social isolation are part of the way we do self-presentation, that we do identity and that we formulate our problems. And that in particular, the in situ perspective gives a glimpse into how people make sense of the role of loneliness in their lives in real time. Furthermore, these topics can be observed and studied systematically in real time in naturally occurring conversation. And this, this particular method gives us that fine grained toolkit. Lastly, the kind of findings that I'm developing and, and writing up and into articles can be used to improve workshops and training materials. So I appreciate your time and I welcome any questions or comments later. Here's my content info and here's some select references. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Stephen. That, that was really interesting and, and methodologically uh, quite innovative in, in my experience. Uh, that, that's great. I, I hope that people are thinking about their questions to the speakers as we go along. Um, if uh, Charlotte, you would like, uh, Stephen, if you wouldn't mind now sure. stopping the share, that'd be great. And Charlotte, if you could cue yourself up, it is over to Charlotte, who is Charlotte Con Constable Fernandez, who is from University College London. Hi everyone. Oh, I'm right at the end of my presentation there. So I'll go back to the beginning. There we go. Great. So I'm going to talk a bit this afternoon about green space, social isolation, and the considerations that we need to think about when using spatially linked data. So firstly, why the built environment? Why is it important? As you've probably heard throughout the day, it's widely accepted that the built environment and the places that we live and where we interact are really important for our health. But in spatial research, it's important to think about how we describe and how we quantify an environment or a neighbourhood. So in this talk, I'll just pick up on green space and the lessons that I've learned when looking at green space as an exposure. So green space in particular, this is just a summary of some of the, the evidence. Green space has, has been shown to be beneficial for our emotional and mental health. So it's showing that just exposure to nature and green space can improve social well-being, emotional well-being, and improve stress regulation, just as some examples. So in my current study, I've been looking at geolinked data in the Millennium Cohort Study. So I'll touch on the Millennium Cohort Study shortly. 
Um, and just to say what we mean by geolinked or spatially linked data is combining our survey level data with geographical or location spatial data. So for instance, in the Millennium Cohort study, we've linked participant postcodes data, so where participants live, to green spaces that are near to them. And our outcomes of interest have been social isolation and mental well-being, and also in a different study, physical activity. So for those of you that aren't familiar with the Millennium Cohort study, it's a prospective longitudinal study that recruited nearly 19,000 children at the beginning of between 2000 and 2002, and they've been followed up throughout their childhood and adolescence and now into adulthood. And as you can see throughout each sweep, different measures have been taken. So we've got a really rich resource of not only physical measures, but also measures on their mental health, their well-being, and things on social isolation as well. But specifically for this talk, again, we'll just think about things that we need to consider when using data that has been linked to spatial information. So I'll briefly touch on the spatial factors, measuring spatial proximity, and which is basically measuring distance between, for example, your home and a nearest green space, how we categorize green space, and then briefly, some epidemiological confounding factors. So there are many approaches that can be used to measure location, uh, proximity between locations. So this image just shows a, uh, an, a map of a borough in South London, and the pink dot in the middle is the middle or centroid of a postcode, and the blue circle around it, that's a buffer radius of 300 meters. And researchers can choose different um, radius. So this one just shows 300 meters. You can choose 500 meters, 1,000 meters. Depends on the question you're asking. And within that buffer, you can see at the orange dots are access points to green spaces. Alternatively, the most simple way to look at uh, distance is as the crow flies or literally straight line from A to B, doesn't take into account roads or pathways. So that's the most simple, but possibly the least sort of realistic. So alternatively to that, we have what we would call network distance, and that does take into account real world routes and pathways that a person would take going from their house to, for example, the park. And the red dotted line here, that shows the shortest space, the shortest path that you can take, um, calculated with a geographical information system. And alternatively, the pink dotted line there, that is calculated as the quickest route. So lots of different ways that you can think about measuring space, spatial proximity. Also really important to think about is how we categorize our green space. At, and this can depend on our outcome. So, for example, if we are looking at general well-being, uh, we know that exposure to greenness is beneficial to well-being and mental health. So we might consider greenness overall. However, if we're looking at um, physical activity or thinking about parks as places to meet and so social isolation, then we need to think about the accessibility and the utility of those green spaces, what they're used for and who's going to use them essentially. So the Ordnance Survey categorizes and groups green spaces into the, the categories that you can see on the screen. And as you can probably already tell, then we need to think about what population we are looking at. So in my study, I'm looking at adolescents. So things like allotments or growing spaces or bowling greens are not going to be probably as relevant as playing fields or sports facilities. So that's something else that needs to be considered. And on the issue of boundaries, so a boundary around a green space and how accessible and how useful a green space is. This is an aerial shot of Pearly Downs Golf Course in South Croydon 
which is a private golf course. It's members only and it's quite expensive. So the people, these houses that you can see all the way around the golf course that encompass the golf course will only be able to access it if they are private paying members. So again, if we're thinking about well-being and that just being around greenness and seeing lots of trees, if that's helpful, then we might include things like private golf clubs in that analysis. However, if we're thinking about physical activity and nearest parks where you can go and actually do exercise or meet or go for walks, then this is not a useful thing to consider unless, of course, these nearby residents are members. And just moving on to epidemiological factors and socioeconomic confounding, as we're probably aware, the relationship between green space and health outcomes is confounded by socioeconomic factors. The most common ways that researchers can account for this is by adding in a socioeconomic covariates. However, this is likely it's not sufficient. So even if we've got many, many variables, we cannot fully adjust away for the confounding, no matter how many variables that we might have. So a couple of the ways that I'm thinking of using to better deal with this includes multi-level models, which cluster individuals within the same geographical unit to account for the fact that people that live closer together are more likely to be similar. Another, Two minutes, please, Charlotte. Another thing that we or option that we could use is negative control outcomes and that is used to detect bias from unmeasured confounding and finally although I have talked about some things to consider there are many many other things that we would need to think about in this type of work so for example season when was the survey data collected that can really impact uh, green space use also work and school environment so when we're not in a pandemic, we have we are not isolated to our neighborhood. So even things like travel between, for example, school or work and home is important to think about all the environment around our workplace. Equally, urban and rural environments. So in an urban city, green space is less likely to be as available as in a rural location. And finally, data protection. So many cohorts or surveys will not allow use of street level or address level information. So postcodes is often the best level that we can get due to confidentiality issues. And like I said, there are many other, many other things that you might have think already thought of that need to be considered. So I just want to say thank you to my supervisors and all these other people that have helped uh, frame this, perform this work. And there are my contact details down there as well, if anyone would like to get in contact and have a chat. Thank you very much. Brilliant, Charlotte. You, you've got 30 seconds for you to wave your hands about and <laughs> talk more. <laughs> but that's great. That gives us more time at the end. Thank you very much. That, that was excellent. Uh, and moving on to our fourth and last speaker, that is Sam Fad Gassami. Sorry, I'll say that again. Sam Fad Gassami from University College London. And he's going to talk about well being in the city. Hi, Laura. Thank you very much. Sorry. I'm just trying to, can everyone see my screen okay? We can see fine. If you press F5, that should hopefully launch the full screen version. F5. I'm using a map. Um, ah, Mac. A map. Can everyone see it okay? Or do you want me to? Uh... If you go down to the bottom, uh, go down, yep, there, that's it. Magic, thank you. This is because I also had some notes. Um, okay. Um, not to worry. If if you'd rather do it without full screen, I'm sure maybe we can bear with you. I'll just ex expand it a bit more. But okay. Um, just had some notes down just because I. Will. Yeah, bear with me for a moment. Thank you. Can can everyone see my screen? Okay. Just wanna. 
It's, it's fine. Uh, all you need to do now is if you go down to the bottom where it says 74%, drag the slider along a bit so that um, you can where see on the right. 70, where does it say 74%? Down, down, there, down with the arrow a bit more. Now along, there's that one more button past the 74 to the right. Uh, uh, is that better? Yes. If you press right to the, to the right, it, it'll fill that little screen box. You mean like this? Oh, you mean? That bit, yeah, you were just over it there. Okay. Click magic. Okay, Thank you. all right, perfect. Okay, okay, so, um, as you all know, my name is Sam, and um, the presentation. So, I'm from the Division of Psychology and Language Sciences, and, I'm, and today I'm going to talk about um, well being in the city, young adult sense of loneliness, and social connection. Um, in uh, deprived urban neighborhoods. So to begin with, um, the design and management of the built environment um, to promote well-being have actually now become a key pl policy priority in the UK and, uh, and other Western countries. In particular, there's been an increasing focus on how urban environments uh, impact our well-being since uh, research has demonstrated that the risk for mental health is higher in, uh, in urban environments than in rural settings. Um, at the same time, loneliness has taken or has moved center stage um, in, in a contemporary time, especially in Western countries and in particular within cities. Um, the concept of the notion of the, lon the lonely city is, you know, is, uh, has been the focus of much of popular writing today. And, um, and so, and at the same time, uh, young people, um, recent research has shown that young people are vulnerable to feeling lonely in, um, in, in the UK and other Western countries. And in the UK, young people from deprived communities, specifically those between the ages of 16 to 24, have been shown to be the loneliest demographic um, in the UK. Oops, sorry, I forgot to move to this slide. Apologies for that. Um, so that was a slide that I just talked about. And then, so we know from a couple of our, uh, of our own studies that we did this year and last year that the causes and experiences of loneliness are linked with um, some of the factors I've put down here are the feeling of being disconnected, sense of isolation, despite being surrounded by others, pressure, social comparison, transition between life stages, overthinking, and fear of being judged. Um, but we don't actually know much about how environmental characteristics such as the built environment and neighborhood design impact loneliness in young people. And we know that th uh, this is important because young adults spent uh, a significant portion of their lives on social media and in online environments and virtual settings. So it's important to understand how young people conceptualize their spatial and social environment. So that obviously, and how these can impact their sense of loneliness um, so that the right interventions can take, can take place. So, um, so that's where our study come, came in. So uh, on this basis, we decided to explore how young, uh, how urban young adults between the ages of 18 to 24 view and experience their neighborhoods and how these experiences um, can impact upon their sense of loneliness as well as social connection because we, we noticed that there's a lack in the literature on social connection and the built environment in young people as well. Um, and we use social representations theory, um, in particular, the themata, dyadic oppositions um, or antinomies to look at, um, to drive our research. And social representation theory um, have been shown to be an important theoretical framework to, you know, to help understand how people make sense of an entity um, and so on. So our two research questions that we wanted to explore are, which places do young adults living in London's most deprived areas considered to be the loneliest and which the most socially connected? And what qualities and characteristics are associated with the loneliest and most socially connected places for young adults for, uh, for, for young adults with this demographic? Now, in order to address these two questions, we conducted a systematic uh, qualitative study on 48 British-born males and females between the ages of 24, 18 to 24 living in London. 
Now, in addition to age, um, lower socioeconomic status, unemployment, renting, and living in the most deprived boroughs um, were associated with greater um, loneliness uh, among young people in the UK. So we, um, we studied participants from uh, boroughs of Newham, Hackney, Tower Hamlets, and Barking at Dagenham in London, because they were ranked with the ranked amongst the most deprived boroughs in London. Now, in terms of our procedure, the task that we used was an inspired version of the free association task. So participants were given a grid of two boxes. They were asked to write down or draw and draw what they, uh, where they felt most socially connected in their neighborhood and where they felt uh, loneliest uh, also in their neighborhood. And, and they were asked to write down why or what it is about the places that make them feel the way they do. Um, so the free association tasks are, are useful because they help to uncover people's thoughts and feelings about their experiences without much interference from researchers. Um, we then elaborated on the contents of what the participants produce in, uh, in the grids through an interview, uh, which is why uh, the method is called the, the grid elaboration. I've just got a couple of examples of the completed free association grid. Uh, one with much text writing and one with image and text just for you to get a feel of what participants um, were exposed to and what they had to do. Now, in terms of our results for our research question about the places that made participants feel most lonely and most socially connected, um, starting from the loneliest, um, this, is all, this is in order. So young people um, considered their homes to be their loneliest place followed by their bedroom, educational institutions, workplace, parks, public transport, um, tubes, and the most socially connected was lone, uh, local neighborhood, um, workplace, home, educational institutions, parks, and religious places. Um, as you can see, there are some overlaps, which I'm gonna talk about in our discussion as to why this occurred. Now, in terms of our um, research question about the qualities and characteristics um, that participants associated with their most socially connected and loneliest places in the neighborhood, four qualities uh, represented as, as dyads or themata um, were identified. So um, these were relationships and sociability. I don't know if you can see my mouse here, but relationships and sociability, comfort, familiarity, activities, and use. So the half top and the, and the top did represent the qualities and um, characteristics for the loneliest places, along with the bottom half representing the qualities and characteristics for the most socially connected places. So let's explore them one by one. So relationships and sociability as a quality was structured around two um, um, two opposing um, structure and two opposing opposing dyads. Um, so one was disconnected from others versus being with family or friends. So, for example, um, participants felt that home was considered to be their loneliest place because although there were you know there were other people around the flat or house, everyone was busy doing their own thing. So people felt young people felt disconnected from others. Um, on the other hand, others felt that the, the home was considered to be their most socially connected place because it was associated with being with friends and family. Two minutes, please. Sure. Moving on to comfort. Um, for example, uh, participants felt that, um, well, this was structured around busy versus peaceful. For example, um, tubes and underground stations were considered to be lonely because they were busy and crowded, so it didn't, it made people uncomfortable, um, whereas parks, for example, were considered to be peaceful uh, and serene, so it was considered, uh, it was associated with um, social connectedness. And then familiarity was structured around unfamiliar environment versus sense of community. So again, unfamiliar environment and being around strangers, particularly in public transportation, was considered to bring loneliness, whereas you know, um, local neighborhoods that had high sense of community and seeing familiar faces was considered to be a socially connected environment. Um, and then finally, activities and use was structured around boredom and nothing to do versus shared goal and interest. For example, being in one's bedroom was considered to be 
boring and having nothing to do, whereas educational institutions were considered to be, you know, um, highly socially conducive uh, um, because uh, participants felt that they could share their goals and interests and activities with others. And then in terms of our discussions, uh, what our study uh, um, revealed, which the previous literature lacked, was that, you know, the same place that was considered to be lonely for others while socially conducive for for, for some um, shows that it wasn't necessarily the places that brought loneliness or, or social, socially connectedness. It was more about uh, how young people viewed those places and what qualities and characteristics they actually attached to those places. Um, we use both verbal and nonverbal um, uh, methods to you know, tap into uh, young people's experience of, uh, experience of loneliness. And this um, basically shows how urban young adults conceptualize um, their neighborhoods, which can be used for urban designers and engineers to design neighborhoods and cities that kind of take those into account. Um, and then Are I'd you like wrapping to, up? Just to wrap up quickly, please. Yeah, thank you, sir. sure. Just to thank my, my supervisor, Professor Helen Joffe, and also Dr. Gemma Moore from the Bartlett Faculty of the Built Environment who collaborate on this project. And then finally, to UCL Grand Challenges for funding this project. Thank you for listening. And here is my email address in case of any contact. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sam. Um, I, I did give you the full 10 minutes, by the way, from when uh, technology started to work for you. Uh, could, could, before we move to questions, could I just ask you to clarify one thing that I wasn't clear on? On slide six, you write in employment. Do you mean unemployment? No, it means in employment. So actually in employment was associated yeah. with, uh, with loneliness. Among young people with those Among... qualities and characteristics, such okay. as in certain neighborhoods, um, and lower SES and so on. Okay, excellent. Okay, that, that is very interesting. All right, I, I can see that um, uh, Robin has uh, been uh, talking to Charlotte in the chat. I, I, I wonder if you would like to uh, ask your question to uh, the audience, Robin, if you'd like to, to elaborate on what you would like to ask. And then I can see Stephen has his hand up. We, we've got uh, a nice chunk of time left before uh, we all disappear into the ether. So let's go for it. So Charlotte, if you'd like to respond to Robin and then over to Stephen. And if anyone else would like to raise their hand, please go ahead. Sure. Hi, Robin and everyone. I think you you were asking about what, what else I'm hoping to uh, explore and look at and um, so part of the my PhD is not is not just green space is um, we're looking at perceived safety and crimes in in teenagers so how adolescents actually feel in their neighborhood whether they feel safe to go outside um, so that would be a really interesting thing to look at and something that I'm not aware of how of much work has been done with that and and well-being and social isolation at all so that'll be something really interesting to to look at as well. Thanks. Thanks, Charlotte. Uh, Stephen, what would you like to ask? Yeah, I just had a question for Dirbla. Um, I really enjoyed your presentation. Thanks for that. And I was just reading one of these sort of like journalists who were trying to summarize that tension here in the US. And it's this, you know, broader discourse of like you know, people are being forced to go to work, but it's not working, or the return to the office is not working. And I think what's so fascinating, and, and I this sort of came up when I was watching your presentation is, is there a way to, or have you found a good way to study that kind of like disconnect where people might say to someone else's face that like, oh, you know, I prefer to rem work remotely, but yet there are also these moments where they, they will admit that like they feel isolated, but it's almost like they're saying like, the sum of everything, the sort of cost benefit analysis is that overall they don't, they just wanna be remote. And I wondered like, cause this article that I read from a journalist, it was totally minimizing that perspective. And, and, and that's sort of one thing I wondered if how you're, you're getting at that second thing briefly is just that um, I wonder if there's a, a way to, um, to think about that some are thinking of other people when they go to the office. And so it's not necessarily their needs, but because I've heard some managers invoke that, like, you know, there may be some among us that need this more than you do. So those are two things if you have time, sorry. 
Yeah, um, I think it's quite interesting, your first point about the cost benefit um, analysis of working from home and people still um, accepting that they would rather work remotely, but are like isolated or feeling lonely. I think especially in London, I'm not too sure about the USA, but um, in terms of like transport and the time it takes to commute into the office, for some people that cost and even the price of it, especially in London is probably going to outweigh the fact that they're going to spend nine hours, you know, maybe lonely. And, um, you know, again, like even with like childcare and things like that, like we're unsure, like obviously in my sample, we had like a large portion of females, like, you know, were they um, also feeling like more lonely because, or like were they also like having childcare responsibilities or, you know, again, even like do, do men potentially feel lonely in different ways? And like, that's why we had, um, you know, the outcomes that we did, but, yeah, I think it is definitely important to take into consideration the way that they might may want to work remotely. And that's why they're feeling maybe like higher satisfaction in some ways or like higher productivity, but still stressed and still having like high experiences of loneliness and workplace isolation, um, which I think is interesting. Um, I'm, uh, could you just repeat your second question again, sorry? Yeah, I think I just, I wondered if one of the complexities for this kind of work going forward is, is also the ways that the managers start to incorporate almost like a thinking about loneliness or thinking about mental health. I've only heard this like hinted at a couple times, but it's almost like trying to encourage a team to think of um, unidentified other people who may need more contact than they do. So it's almost like trying to be mindful of the community rather than one's own need to not want to commune. Yeah, um, definitely. And I think that is like one of the things that I will be like, um discussing um in my research is that like it will have to potentially be kind of uh you know a specific intervention potentially some people want to work remotely and giving people the opportunity or sort of like maybe like a hybrid sort of working um or giving people more um opportunity to decide whether they want to do it or not but i think also in my sample because it is south london and Monty, which is like the mental health service um the biggest one within the nhs in the uk i think it would be interesting to look at you know like even patients like is it affecting patients that they can't come into the service as well as how it's affecting the, um, uh, the staff, uh, which I think is like, quite interesting. But again, that's going to have to be a discussion that people have and they're going to have to look at the bigger picture in the context of the work that they do, because it's psychiatric appointments, it's you know clinical um, consultations and things like that. So it's an interesting population that I work with, definitely. And probably the people here are mostly more aware nearly of like loneliness and isolation and the impact it will have. So I think that's why it's like a very interesting topic. Uh, that, that was a very interesting conversation. Does anyone else have any questions? I've got one for you, Stephen. I, I was wondering, could you elaborate on whether the callers to the helplines spoke about where they're situated at the time of the call? Did you get any sense of whether they were on their own or uh, in the city or in the countryside? Anything that, that actually gives us a sense of the physical context? Yeah, I think that um, I haven't sort of tracked that systematically myself, but I can think of it being fairly rare. And I think what's really interesting about that is is the anonymity of the calls. And I think that um, one peculiar thing about helplines is that sometimes helplines will present themselves as being anonymous and things like that. But then sometimes I think the callers don't maybe understand how much data they get just from their phone number and things like that. So I think, and about the same time, people calling from cell phones, that's not the most informative thing because it doesn't actually say where they're at. Um, but I think that in many ways, um, uh, for instance, some some helplines will actually call, will actually track the phone numbers in the sense that if someone calls from the same phone number five times, they're going to be logged in the system, and so the system will document where they're calling from. Or if the if the caller mentioned where they were calling from in the call, then it'll be logged in that report. It will tend to be documented over time. This person lives in blank. Um, so so it's interesting how much it doesn't come up, I would say, but I think that if it's the, the caller is, is going through some kind of distress related to where they're at or being alone and um, in a particular location, then it, then it comes up. But I think it's fairly rare. So it's a really interesting, interesting question. Yeah. Uh -huh. thank, thank you. So a couple of a couple of uh, uh well actually most of the presentations raise the issue of place in one way or another are there any other place related questions that people would want to raise yeah 
I'm heading from campaign to end loneliness. Um, yeah, question for Sam, really. Um, I was interested in that kind of overlap between the, the lonely and unlonely places and the fact that obviously different individuals had different um, kind of perceptions of similar types of places and whether they kind of induced loneliness or not and you said that you had kind of um, recommendations for perhaps designers coming out of your research so do you have a sense of what those recommendations would be given the sort of conflicting perhaps demands of those different individuals in terms of making places more less lonely for young people overall? Yeah, thank you, Helen. That's a good question. So I guess what I would recommend is for um, designers um, and, uh, and engineers to think about the um, think about the, the qualities as opposed to the places themselves. So, for example, places that promote sociability, comfort, um, places that promote familiarity should be taken into account for engineers when they're designing future cities and neighborhoods, whereas places for neighborhoods that, for example, are busy and are um, considered to be unfamiliar or they encourage boredom should also be taken into account not to be implemented, so should be taken into account to, to be avoided, for example. So I think what the study suggests is to think about or consider the qualities and, and characteristics um, and, and, and implement them. Okay, thank you. That, that, that's, that's a really good point, Helen. And I think that was raised by Charlotte's presentation on, on, on thinking about the, the specific, specifically relevant places for young people rather than generalizing to say green spaces, for example, are good for everyone. What sort of green space and for whom uh, clearly is very important. Robin, did you want to say something? You've probably got the last word. Um, no, I was going to ask if, if there's any opportunity to follow up with people to see how their things might have developed after the pandemic. Um, in terms of the research that I'm doing, so it was a survey measure, so it's like all anom anonymous. Um, we're still collecting data and I have been uh, posting it on LinkedIn and I have had a lot of responses of people asking me that they would be really interested in hearing the results and everything. And obviously we'll be like looking quite closely to getting this like uh, published as well in the future. So. Hopefully the results will be there, but it won't. It would be quite hard to follow up um, just with the survey sample. Yeah. Well, that, that, uh, Robin's question points to uh, a point that was made earlier today about the, the value of longitudinal research, um, and uh, I, I certainly uh, something that I've learned uh, in recent times about the power that you have in tracking somebody or tracking on the one hand a group and on the other hand a place as it develops over time. So. Um, I think there's there's plenty more scope to be looking in this area. Um, I am keeping a very close eye on the time, so I'm going to start to wrap up in order to, if anyone wanted to pop a last question or to ask for contact details, you still have time in the chat, but I would like to uh, thank very much our speakers, Derbler, Stephen, Charlotte, Sam, uh, to all the participants for the great questions, to Millie for tweeting. I haven't seen the tweets, but I'll be looking. Um, and we are about to enter our break time. We will resume at 15.50 for a panel discussion on next steps for addressing loneliness, social isolation in the context of mental health. Um, if you could please return to the main room, stay silent.